You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach. I know I'm not in school, but September feels to me like the beginning of the new year. Does it feel that way to you? I don't think I will ever, ever get over the feeling that a semester is starting, or even I divide my life in terms of fall and spring semester. I guess it's going to stop one day, but I can't imagine when. And isn't it always crazy how Labor Day is always different? The weather is always different. This year, of course, it rained because of all the storms and Dorian, what a beast she is, and the cooler temperatures. And then the next day, it's always nice. My father used to say, how does it know? How does it know? Who is it? Anyway, I have a baby grandson. And, you know, whenever I talk about my dad, I get this pang. I miss him so much. But I guess the baby is a little bit of a compensation. Now, I said grandson pretty easily. I'm having trouble with that word, grandson. But he is a little creature of joy and not so little. He's over the charts or through the charts, big and tall. He's 27 and three quarter inches long, which is long. I mean, he's four months and he's adorable and he smiles. And when he doesn't smile, he's not as adorable, but I love him either way. And I got to see him a lot the last week of summer. So that made for a happy me a really happy me. I can even hear the smile in my voice. Can you hear it when I'm thinking of the baby? Is that corny? I don't even offer to show pictures of him to everyone. I'm amazed. I have to say, quite frankly, when people learn that I have a, when my family has a baby, I keep thinking the automatic thing is to say, oh, can I see a picture? Not that many people offer. And you know what? I don't offer all the time either because I don't want to become one of those people. But if you would like to see a picture of my grandson, I would be happy to show it to you. Which leads us to my five things that make life better for me. Maybe not for you, but I want you to come up with your five things. And you know what I also want you to do? I probably should say it someplace else on this podcast, but I would love it if you would subscribe to this podcast. Then if I forget to post it on Friday, you'll get it automatically anyway. You'll be ahead of me. You'll be ahead of the curve. And I'm thinking about the curve because my guest today is author Paul Tuff, who's written a book about college that is so important because we're not applying to college again. It's our kids who are applying to college. His book is called The Years That Matter Most, How College Makes or Breaks Us, and you will enjoy him very much. Okay, number one, the baby. The baby, exhibit mm, E, I think in this case, exhibit E. He's all about love, those smells, those baby smells, the feeling when he smiles at me that I'm chosen, just like the president. I'm the chosen one, and I'm soaring. I'm so happy. His soft skin, his innocence, his chubby legs, his tiny toes. I could eat him up. Okay, I'm done. I'm calming down now. Number two, Lake Tahoe. I had never been there before. How many of you have been there? Let's see a show of hands. Well, as you probably know, Lake Tahoe is shared by both California and Nevada. It's so deep and clear and clean. It is phenomenal. You can look down and see 90 feet. You can see to the bottom, and it's a lake. That's why it's called Lake Tahoe. The thing is also part of the Nevada part of Lake Tahoe has casinos and slot machines, and it's very commercial and kind of, I don't know, a little tacky. And then the rest of it is hiking and pines and the air and the mountains and the hills are alive. I think I burst into song too. It's beautiful. The water is cold. The friends that we visited made us jump in in our clothes. Okay. I didn't 
really love that part, but I did it. But it's so beautiful. It's America. Come on, people. Let's all go to Lake Tahoe. And it has a beach. But as we know, I love the water and I love Lake Tahoe. We went to a wedding there that was also very beautiful. Outdoors, beautiful. Number three... One thing that I noticed at the wedding were lots and lots of ranunculus. I believe these were grown at home by the parents of the bride, and they were beautiful. The bride wore a few tucked into her chignon, but a ranunculus is, the leaves are papery like a poppy, but there are many of them like a rose, and they get brighter or paler depending on as you're looking in or looking out. I love them. I think they get... No rap at all, ranunculus, A, because they have a funny name and may be hard to spell, and B, because they don't have a fragrance. But they are beautiful. They were all over this wedding in vases and in hair, and so were sunflowers, and it was just so charming and so beautiful. And, you know, if you love water, you love flowers, probably. I mean, nothing wrong with that. Number four, Middle Eastern food. In Los Angeles, where I went to visit the exhibits and their exhibits, we ate at a restaurant called Jaffa. There are a few of them. We went to the one on West 3rd Street. Oh, my gosh. The food was so good. Now, look, not everybody, not not all the, the Middle Eastern food in the world is hummus and tahina and falafel. But they had a sweet potato hummus that was really good. I could go for some now. And there was a uh, tahina with charred eggplant that was scary good. And they had couscous and lamb. They had a lot of salads, a lot of spiced chicken. And I had brisket with uh, roast Brussels sprouts, which doesn't really sound like Middle Eastern. It just sounds like something delicious. But Middle Eastern food, check it out. It's, you know, you can't eat pizza and sushi all the time. I mean, you probably could, but should you? Okay. And number five, for those of you who have been listening to this podcast for a while, you know, I went crazy, crazy, crazy over the Lehman trilogy, the play I saw last winter in New York with three actors, three outstanding actors portraying all of the Lehman Brothers from the first generation that came to the United States to the people in 2007 who presided over the downfall of this uh, huge bank. Well, those actors are performing the play again. They've been at the West End in London at the National Theater. And on September 15th, there will be a live simulcast in this country of the Lehman Trilogy. I go to a lot of theater, and not that I know better than anyone. I'm just saying I love this more than I've loved almost any play in years and years. This The, the cast of three who morph into many, many personae are incredible. There's something very dreamlike about the play. If it's playing at a theater near you, go see it. Go see it. Oh, I think I'm going to see it again. I loved it that much. Paul Tuff, our guest today, has written the book, The Years That Matter Most, How College Makes or Breaks Us. And since everybody I know who is a kid in high school asks me constantly about college and asks me for advice, and because I used to write college guidebooks, I'm thrilled that Paul is going to be here in person. He also has written How Children Succeed, Grit, Curiosity, and the Hidden Power of Character. He writes regularly and speaks regularly about education. And this new book is important now, post-Varsity Blues. I mean, who's applying to college, parents or the kids? And who's the college choice for? parents or the kids. We'll be right back with Paul Tuff. Paul Tuff has written the book, The Years That Matter Most, How College Makes or Breaks Us. It's now published just out by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And of course, as a collegeophile, 
and a college admissions mm, almost in the field person. I have a million questions for you. The timing for your book, Paul, couldn't have been better post Rick Singer scandal, although you couldn't have known this years ago when you started writing. No, it was all more crazy than even I suspected. It gets crazier and crazier. I have three children I refer to as my exhibits. Mm -hmm. And from their uh, seven, no, they're nine years apart from the oldest to the youngest. And in those nine years, those spring of junior year tours got bigger and bigger and bigger at the same schools. And then by the time Exhibit C was traveling around colleges and telling me not to ask questions on the tour because I was embarrassing her, Mm -hmm. which I want to say all three of my exhibits had, there were eighth graders on the tour. I have been trying to tell people, yes, college can be a transformative experience, but if you start forming your life around your college aspirations or more likely your parents at that age, you're in for a long, painful haul. That's definitely true. I mean, the the thing the thing that I worry about with my book is that, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to young people from all over the country, uh, but I also spent a lot of time talking to economists and sociologists and trying to understand, like, what we knew about w- who college matters for and when it matters. And, like, when you talk to the economists, the, the story that they, they – that their data tells you is actually not a super reassuring one, right? No, right. It's, it, like, it really kind of does matter where you go to college, right? And so – I think part of what what I'm trying to figure out as I'm talking to parents, especially, and and you know, a few years from now when I'm thinking about it as uh, as a parent, as a parent of a sixth grader, <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's like it is true and important when you think about the makeup of our country that where kids go to school matters, and it is true that we have a very unbalanced higher education system and. It's true that like the a lot of the wealthiest kids go to the schools that actually do help you most in terms of social mobility and how much you're going to make as an adult. And it's true that a lot of low-income kids go to the schools that are going to help you the least, and that is a problem, right? So I think it's important to note that, but at the same time to also note that that – uh, that one data point has also driven us slightly insane because any given um, family or parent or student, and especially in affluent communities, I think is a, is convinced that that data point matters absolutely for them and the specific for, for place, the rest of their lives. Right, and the specific place that they go is going to make a huge difference. Right. Now, first of all, the college experience that I have written about, and that you write about, and have written about before is largely skewed to the haves anyway. The process known as early admission is truly skewed to someone who has an active and vigilant college advisor, which most kids in in poor neighborhoods don't have, means that you have the grades, which means you may have been tutored all through high school. I mean, it really favors the privileged. Well, and, and I mean, the thing about early decision, you're right. So just there's also just the sort of like who who knows about it and who, who knows, knows how the system it. works. Right. But even beyond that, the thing about early decision is if you get an offer, you have to take it, right? No matter right. what kind you're of aid you get. You're committed to it. Right. And so if you're a like middle class or low income kid, uh, you can't do that because right. you have to get a few different offers and compare costs. And leverage your offers. Exactly. And so it's only uh, a family that can afford to pay whatever the college says they've got to pay that can c- make that early admissions commitment. So f- for starters, when people when when you go to a high school information night, which usually happens freshman or sophomore year, and the parents are being told by an earnest counselor what to do, and they're being told that early decision, whew, it takes the pressure off, and your kid gets to enjoy senior year and and can devote themselves to their other interests and the great electives that you only get as a senior in high school. That's kind of baloney or malarkey, as Ned would say, because that's not really the case for everybody. Yeah, I mean, I think think for... for kids who can do it, for kids who know about it and can afford to do early decision, it, it can work and it can give you that you know, oh, much more gosh, laid yeah. back uh, senior year. Yes. Um, but I think it's designed to work for a very specific population. Does the craziness that we now see 
around us, whether it's Lori Loughlin and her her daughters playing water polo at USC or whatever it was, and 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 the people who are giving three and a half million dollar gifts. Just that number keeps coming up a lot. Three and a half million yeah, dollars, the, the magic number the to the Ivy League schools. Is the craziness coming from parents? Is it coming from kids? Is it coming from high schools? Where are the expectations and the pressures uh, originating? I think it's bigger. I think it's it's this sort of broad cultural shift that has happened. I mean, I think in any given family, it seems like it's the parents usually who are putting the sort of immediate pressure on their kids and on the system. Um, they're the ones who feel like they've already invested so much in this right. uh, exhibit, in this product. <laughs> yes. Uh, and they've got to make sure that they get their return on investment. Um but I think I do think that that those parents are in the midst of this system that is pushing them all in this direction. I mean, for for me, like so, in my book, I went back and looked at a lot of the history of higher education, and one of the periods that I spent time on was the GI Bill era. Right. So this period right after World War II, where suddenly there's this huge influx. Um, of returning GIs who go to college, and it changed. It not only vastly expanded higher education in the United States, it also changed the face of higher education. Suddenly, there were all these um, low-income, working-class, you know, the k- children of farmers and and dock workers who were going to college. That was this whole new thing, right? And there was this era, it probably had something to do with you know World War II ha- being over. Uh, where we as a country pulled together around the collective higher education of our young people. And it was like, the, what's happening in those colleges, even if my kid's not there, is good for us all, right? And we don't think that way anymore, right? We well, think we of it as think this. Of, we didn't think of elitism the way we do now as both the, the desire and the fear. It, uh, say more what you mean. Well, the word elite is now just kind of the, the go-to uh, descriptor for a fine college. Right, right, right. We used to not call them that. They used to be hard to get into right, or, right. or or good schools. Right. I mean, and now, you know, and one wants to go to an elite school, but then, oh, I don't want to be considered an elitist. Right. But that's still sort of Totally. Looming. I mean, I, it, the language that we now use to talk about college, I think, is the language of, of consumerism, right? Yes. Like we think yes. of it as a consumer good, good. thing you You're can right. buy. Right. But it is... There's a couple things wrong, I think, with when you start thinking about it as a consumer good. One is that it can be very frustrating for those who like buying things because <laughs> you, you can't, can't afford it. <laughs> well, you can't afford it, and but, you just can't buy yeah, it. Yeah, you can't. Well, like you can't guarantee it. I mean, that three was and a half million, right? But that was the you know like what what Rick Singer's case was to those parents was um, there's the front door, the back door, and the side door, right? And so he was saying the front door is for suckers. That's right. just actually sending in your application. The back door is the three and a half million, and I'm. I've created the side door. And he said, the advantage of my door over the back door, the giving the big donation, uh, first of all, it's cheaper. It's only, you know, a few hundred thousand instead of a few million. Uh, but second, it's guaranteed that even when you give the the uh, auditorium or the gymnasium, they they can't guarantee you that they'll let you in. I can, I've got a, this sewn up, right? As we learned later, there were some problems <laughs> with this side door, <laughs> but like that was the pitch. Um, but you can see the frustration that like for a family, for an individual who is used to being able to buy something and have it guaranteed, the fact that college admissions is this crazy system where you like the colleges are bidding on the kids and the kids are bidding on the colleges, I think it can be really bewildering to to parents and to kids. Every part of it is bewildering. And if you're not bewildered, there's something wrong with you, I think. I mean, even what, financial aid is the most bewildering aspect of it. And you're asking people who may not have mathematical and financial literacy to fill out a ton of paperwork that would require them to know more about their finances. This whole shift I have thought about a lot, and I am wondering whether parents, and and this is just a small piece of it, but the parents I know who did not go to the, let's say, top schools, I'd rather use that term, but who went to schools that used to be called safeties, and we can talk about that in a second too, they're the ones who seem to be the most motivated to get their kids in to the top schools. Interesting. And I see that they, they're they the ones who start buying the pen bumper stickers and the, and the stuffed animals, and it becomes a family experience that they have a kid at an Ivy or wherever. And it just makes me feel sad for the kid because I always tell people or have told people, 
go to the best school, and you discuss this in your book, The Years That Matter Most, go to the best school you get into. If they think you can do the work, believe me, you can do the work. And Because when you finally get to college, you're going to, uh, I mean, I walked in thinking everybody's brighter because I, I was waitlisted and they all got in. But there are a lot of dopes in college, no matter where you go. And it <laughs> may not be true. that they're athletes who got in on an athletic scholarship, or it could. It may not mean that they are triple legacies that the school wouldn't dare refuse. They're just, they're dopes. Or, or they may be smart at math, but really unable to hold a conversation. Hey, Lisa, how's it going? <laughs> I mean, how many... Flashback. Flashback. But, but I just feel like, in a way, the people who are not served best are the students themselves. This is, you know, I even slipped and said when the kid, when the parents are trying to get into college. Right, right. I know. I think a lot of parents feel like feel that I way. Feel, I think a lot of kids feel that way. That I they're just, think so. They're, they're trying to help their parents get into the college of their choice. The process when I was in high school was so much kinder. The numbers were so much smaller. The number of international students were so much smaller. And that is a that is a consideration. Mm -hmm. And the price of college was always said to be the price of an average standard American car. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in those days, if you were bad at something, as I was, that didn't matter because I was strong at other things and you didn't have to be a super kid. Now you have to be good in every subject, in every discipline. You have to do work in a lab. You have to have invented something, patented something, and have an ongoing business. It doesn't feel like what we're putting our kids through is fair, reasonable, or in any case what we had to do. And this is kids across the board. These and, are your Kikis and your Shannons as yeah. well as your Julias and Olivers. And I think the the effect on kids is just an enormous amount of stress. You know, so uh, I, I'm certainly among the low-income students who I met. So the first scene in the book is me sitting on a park bench with a, a young woman from the Bronx as she's waiting to find out what school she got into. She's extremely stressed. She's been stressed for years. But the same thing, you know, I went and hung out at this uh, SAT tutoring center um, very high priced in Washington D.C. and uh, it's the same thing it's going the same on there. Thing. Those kids are like they they are spending years thinking about one number, their SAT or ACT score, and just this one question of where they get in. Um, and I think it really deprives kids of an adolescence. and And I think it goes to this enormous amount of stress that we've put on on this experience. The you know the thing is I like. I, I I do feel like at the same time, I mean, I mean, I call this book the years that matter most, right? right so right. I, at the same time, I do think for any individual student, um, it is a good idea that they calm down and certainly that their parents calm down. But I think the bigger problem is the fact that we have created a system where all of this uh, process of mobility and opportunity um, really does go along with what school you get into. You know, I, I write about this this amazing book called Pedigree, uh, written by this um, sociologist at Northwestern named Lauren Rivera. And she spent a lot of time with recruiters for big investment banks and law firms and consulting companies that were recruiting kids who were coming out of these highly selective schools. And it's it's your worst nightmare. You know, it's like everything that you want to believe is not the case. They're saying we only look at like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. Everybody else just sort of goes in the in the garbage. Um, we don't really care what kind of grades you got. We just care about like what sports you played in high school. So like on the one hand, I feel like we want to tell kids, you know, it's a meritocracy. Like we, you know, wherever you go, you can find lots of options. At the same time, there are all these clues in the system that it really is rigged in exactly the way we fear. Well, it's rigged. My metrics, the metrics that we most often hear are how much you will earn how much you will earn if you graduate from Princeton versus Penn State, two schools you posited, mm -hmm. how much you'll earn if you're a business major versus a liberal arts major. But it's not the only thing that matters when, in terms of what you get out of your college experience. And how do we make that case for families who are going through this now? For sure. I mean, I, 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 and again, I feel like it's it's the, it's the economist perspective versus the the sort of human perspective, and I think both are true. Like, it is important to note that kids who who get out of Princeton are making more money than than uh, students who are going to Penn State, right? Um, but yeah, for any individual kid, like uh, that isn't how we want them to 
measure the success of their lives or of their college careers. We want them to be able to think think much differently. I mean, I think it's part of the reason that so many kids at those schools do go into those professions, like do go into consulting and law and investment banking, whether they have any interest in these things or not, because yeah. it's a system that just says you're measured by these certain You could metrics. be a Russian history major, but when you see that Goldman Sachs is coming to recruit on your campus, you think, okay, what, whatever, right. I'll go. Right. And it does prepare perpetuate this this gap between people. I mean, honestly, I know this is very controversial, but the money shouldn't be the only thing that we measure. Satisfaction, uh, uh, being able to raise a family, being able to do good works in your neighborhood. I mean, I don't know how. I, I'm sure you've met people who could actually figure that stuff out. But I, I do think the focus on money and income post college, which makes sense because college is expensive and people graduate with phenomenal draconian loans. But still, is there a way in your mind we can move away from that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's what we're talking about, a big cultural shift. I don't think it's something that, that, you know, just has to do with universities. It has to do with how competitive versus collective our, our country is now. And part of the reason I think that it's hard for for kids in that in that circumstance, and one of the reasons that I think so many of them do go into when they're graduating from those super prestigious colleges, they do go into investment banking or law, as well as the fact that they've got student loans to pay off. Is is that like we don't? This process has I think warped adolescence and early adulthood so much that we don't give them a chance in college to do what college is actually kind of about, which is kind of figuring out who you are, right? And it's this very mushy idea. And like, I can hear all the parents saying like, we're not spending $100,000 a year for you to yes, find you out who are. you are. But, yes, you are. But yeah, like that's what 18 year olds do, right? <laughs> that is the point of life at that, at the, for those years. And, and like, let's hope it's not just like, you know, hitchhiking around the country and finding out who you are. Let's hope you're also gaining some skills and connections and, um, and other things as you're doing that. But like, there's got to be some trial and error. There's got to be following your interests. There's got to be weird dead ends and mistakes and strange nights that you regret later. And like that's all part of the process. That's right? how you learn. You learn from those boo boos. And you and and for me, the idea of I, I I wouldn't have friends from college all these years later if it was just about majoring in a subject to get the most money. Right. I, I probably majored in the subject to guarantee me to make the least amount of money. Damn it. Right. <laughs> and I loved my college life. I loved my college years. And you meet people who are different from you and you gain perspectives just from wandering the hall and right. people talking to you. Yeah. And I think that's true in lots of different types of institutions, too. I mean, I think that's true. You know, I mean, so I spent a lot of time reporting at the University of Texas, which is an unusual place because of the way that they select their students. But it's this it just had this great feel of like people from all over the state, from lots of different communities, um, like getting together and sharing, sharing this experience together. And, you know, Texas is unusual. But like for, for them, I think there was this this there was both this diversity in where they came from, but also this sense of unity. Like we're a state school. This is the flagship. We're Texans. We're Longhorns. That's a great experience for it's a great to experience. Have. And when you wander the UT campus, you also see Campus Crusade for Christ. You also see Campus Socialists. I mean, it right. is a it is a really heterogeneous community. Yeah. So there's this sort of unity and diversity that is, you know, kind of like an American idea. Right. Y- yeah. And when you can experience that in college. It's a yeah, thing. Paul, an 18 year old kid is still a kid, very much a kid. Uh, do you get a sense that this 18 year old, our, our collective 18 year olds, know what to do when they get to college? Are they using their good judgment? Are they scared of themselves? What's going on in their brains and with them? I mean, I think for any individual young person, it's like it's a it's a strange and confusing time for me. Definitely, like when I got to college, it was totally confused. Um, and, and so, I think for a lot of kids, it is. But I think there's also this um, kind of like social cultural side to it, which is that 
for some kids, and especially kids who are growing up in affluence, going to an institution, especially a highly selective institution, it doesn't feel that jarring. You know, it feel, I think for a lot of kids, it just feels like this is just the next step on expect- this path. And, and right. they've been primed this for it for so long. Supposed to go. Yeah. And it's for some of them, like applying was so hard that like the actual going to college is like, okay, the hard, like junior year of high school is the hardest thing I'll ever do. This right. is going to be a piece of, piece of cake. And sometimes it kind of is, right? Right. Um, but I think the, the, the students for whom it is most jarring is those rare uh, low-income first-generation college students who who do go to elite campuses, uh, to highly selective campuses, and I write about some of them in my book. And for those, there's this amazing um, sociologist named Anthony uh, Abraham Jack who's written a whole book called The Privileged Poor about the experiences that these kids have. Um, it's an amazing book, and he describes this way that depending on what kind of experiences young people have had before they get to uh, college, they can they can either be going through this incredible culture shock that's sometimes really hard to deal with, or it can seem very kind of matter of fact. There are programs like the one in New York called Prep for Prep and A Better Chance, and these are programs that find very motivated, underprivileged kids and their parents, and and make them really do a, a whole side school on weekends and get them ready for private school, for high school, and then college. Those seem to know what they're doing. Those yeah. kids do seem to do very well. They have their own college admissions program, and um, uh, th- those students seem very successful. They from are, what I gather, they are. I mean, so and that I got that from Tony Jack, uh, right. this uh, Harvard sociologist, from his research, um, and yeah, I mean, so there's two things I think that that uh, is amazing about those kids in in Tony Jack's research. One is um, that they represent. It's a pretty small group. Like perhaps not tiny, but like it's not that many kids. It represents a huge fraction of the low income, especially Black and Latino kids who are on these highly selective campuses. Like it is just. I mean the the, these programs are really like doing the work of the uh, admissions departments. In, they're doing for the work of colleges, the high schools. Right? To, I mean, they're really yeah. They're doing everything. They, they are. They, I they're mean, making the transition possible. Right. And but the other thing that's really striking, um, and it's at the at the root of this book, the privileged poor that Tony Jack wrote, is that their experience on when they get to campus is totally different than other low income uh, Black and Latino kids when they get to these same campuses, which is like. Everyone, if you're if you're changing class, everybody goes through culture shock. It's always like social mobility is always jarring and weird and confusing. But if you are in like a prep for prep style program, you have that weird experience when you're 14, right? Mm-hmm. When you get to your prep school, your boarding school, and it still is weird and still is strange, and you can't believe people live like this and they're nothing like you. But then you know you spend four years being indoctrinated <laughs> into boarding school life, and by the time you get to college, you're like, you, you like these kids are still poor. Like it hasn't changed their circumstances. But they get what it's like to have friends with ski chalets and like have, you know, classes with four kids in them and sit outside and all the things that you get when you're living that kind of life. Whereas other kids were equally academically talented, but stayed in the giant, you know, uh, public schools uh, that those kids were airlifted out of. Academically, they're maybe doing the same. Financially, they may be doing the same. But culturally, emotionally, their their experiences are totally different. For those kids, and Tony Jack calls them the doubly disadvantaged. He calls the kids who went to boarding school the privileged poor. For those doubly disadvantaged kids, they're now having their culture shock at 18. And it's much harder to go through culture shock at 18 than 14, partly because, you know, you're, you're more formed as a personality. But also because, like, prep schools uh, are... I mean, part of part of their their reason for being is to shape and mold people, right? Like that's kind of the ethos of when you're there. Like you're learning how to be a certain type of person, right? But in college, there's this ethos of like you, you just figure things out for yourself, and so you're not being shaped in that same way. And for those kids, it can often uh, make them feel very very alone, very mm-hmm. not taken care of. Mm-hmm. Why do colleges now court that first generation um, uh, cohort? Well, it's a question of how much they are co- uh, courting them. I mean, the numbers are still pretty low. Like right. first generation uh, numbers at the highly selective colleges are still quite low. But I think they do court that prep for prep cohort. Um, but I'm talking about the people who didn't the the disadvantaged, disadva- doubly disadvantaged. Right. Why is it that these colleges are are speaking? They're they're talking a big game about how we're very interested in first generation college yeah. students. Are they saying that 
because they mean it? Are they saying that because they want to give their privileged students a chance to be exposed to really poor kids? Or are they doing it because they want to help the world? Um, well, it's a great question, and I think there are many answers to it. But I think the most important thing is that they're, they are talking a big game. You know, that, that they, they're, when you look at the data, there has not actually been a big change in how many low-income students go to highly selective institutions. And, in fact, very few do. I think we have this idea in our heads that actually it's those institutions where there's a lot of, whole lot of low-income kids because that's what they keep telling us, right? Like, and that's because what they, they keep boasting about their huge endowments. Right. And they should be spending, <laughs> spending it on those And they should be spending kids. it on those kids. Um, and, and, you know, I feel like I go back and forth from my levels of cynicism and skepticism and and, and and sort of utopianism when I think about this. And, I, you know, mostly these are like universities. So they are like filled with idealistic, progressive, like nice people, right? Um, but the reality is these, these, these institutions still are mostly uh, uh, recruiting and enrolling super rich kids. Um, that has not changed. Uh, and I think that they want to have, on some level, they want to have low-income students there for all the reasons that you said. It, it's better for the campus. It it's better be. for the rich kids. It's better for the poor kids. It would be better if things were more balanced. So I think there are a million reasons why they take the steps that they do. The question that I keep asking is why they're not taking more steps, because they could. They could, and that would be sort of as close to the GI Bill right. as we once had, which really equalized a playing field for a lot of people for a generation or two generations. Yeah, and it kind of worked, right? It like worked. <laughs> that, yeah. That's what created the middle class, uh, the post-war middle class. That's what created like this incredible boom that happened. Like that is how, and other countries do it too, right? Like they decide, you know, we like there are signs in our economy that we don't have enough educated kids. Um, and it's not like we need a whole lot more kids with PhDs, but we need more kids with like two and four year degrees, right? And we're making it way too hard for them to get them. And in the the same way that the GI Bill, we just said, like, you know what, we need more kids to go to college. Let's pull together and make this happen. Um, we could do that again. But I think we've been indoctrinated uh, or indoctrinated ourselves with this competitive idea that college is just this thing that if if you get it, then I don't get it. <laughs> so we have more to for, fight for it. More for me. Exactly. Right, and right. it's this, this, this competitive mindset that, that I think is is making things difficult not only for those low income first generation kids but also for the the kids with money because they are they are are being put into the system that is making them anxious making them depressed <laughs> making them competitive and stressing them out well and today's young people are notoriously anxious depressed medicated and uh, dropping out of school yeah and I think all the, you know, the, like the numbers about how depression on campus has gone up uh, just in the last decade are scary. Um, and I think it's connected to that. I mean, it's connected to a lot of, of course, things. But I, yeah. think, I think when we put so much pressure on this process uh, and this one question, I think kids feel it. Absolutely. Finally, the squad concept. When people from poor communities go to a prestigious college, a private school, they 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 don't last at, they're not comfortable they may feel like they are being un, untrue to their community they un, un, unfaithful to their parents in some way they may feel guilty at having all this privilege suddenly and i've read that when they go with a kind of well, the uh, the posse a, there's a posse, this thing the posse program. the posse yeah. institute or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah that they actually do better because they have friends to, who have been through the same experience that they can relate to and relate yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. So the the posse program is this is this program that right recruits a whole group of like twelve or twenty kids from a particular city and and they all go together to a, a highly selective institution and it's great. But there are lots there are other ways to do it as well. But I I do think that these institutions there's, there's a couple of problems. I spent some time um, uh, on the campus of Princeton following this one young woman who came from a really low income background as she was trying to find a sense of community in a place where she felt like she didn't fit at all. Um, she was doing great academically but felt really at odds with with the sort of 
social and financial life on the campus. Um, and, and so I think there's two problems. One is just the way that those institutions are selecting their students. They're selecting so many rich kids and so few poor kids um, that it's natural for those kids to feel out of place because they are out of place. There just aren't that many kids like them, right? So that's something that could change in the admissions office. But there is also a lot that the institution itself can do. You know, like it's not that hard to make people who are different from everybody else feel at home. Like there are certain, it's like when someone comes to your house, right? There's certain yeah. uh, steps you take to make right. someone feel welcome and accepted. Um, and I think there's this mindset that a lot of colleges have that um, that's not our job. That's like there's a, oh, there's it's a sink their or swim. job. It is their job. It's and when their they do job. their and when they do their job, it makes a huge difference. It, it makes, really does work for those. Yes. Folks. Well, I have an exhibit who's in who's at Brown, oh. and she um, she told me about all the first generation activities that they have and have provided, which makes that community, which is so prized by these prestigious schools, to they feel better. Yeah, it can really make a difference. It works. Paul Tuff, it's really cool to talk to you. I hope people will read this book, The Years That Matter Most, How College Makes or Breaks Us. And I hope the people who should read your book, read your book, find out about your book, and um, find out about you and your work. Because it's, it's really cool. And college... I used to joke college could be the best decade of somebody's <laughs> life, but but now no, you know it's a, we're in a serious time and college is all about results, baby. Yeah, and I think it can be again. I think it. I think it. It. it, it we're in a, a period of mania that I think we can get past. We've got to get past it. Okay, Paul. I am interested in your five things that Great. make your life better, if Great. you don't mind. All right. Okay. Um, number one. Number one is this collection of little green books called the Penguin Modern Series, um, and they're published by by Penguin in the UK. Um, I think they cost like one euro over there, but they cost like five dollars here, uh, and it's all these like little essays like uh, Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. Um, right now I'm reading Susan Sontag's notes on camp. Um, all these things that like you should have read but probably didn't because it's hard to find them. Um, and uh, they're like beautiful like literal pocket books that you can put in your pocket. Um, and so it's great reading back through all these amazing books. Documents. Books. Books people. Yeah. Yes. Number two. Number two is an app called iNaturalist. Uh, so I have a two kids, a four-year-old son and a 10-year-old son, and we often use this together. So iNaturalist is this app where if you take a picture, so like in I live in Texas where there's lots of weird bugs and <laughs> cactus and birds and lizards, uh, you see something going by, you don't know what it is, you take a picture of it, and you upload it to this uh, site, and th th there's an AI that guesses what it is. You choose that, and then there's actual experts around the country that then will say, no, actually, the AI was wrong in this case. Um, and then you get a collection. So I have a collection of like 60 animals that I've seen, that, and it shows me like where on a map it was. Um, so I'm not a naturalist in the past, but I've become a naturalist. I like, a naturalist. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wait, um, have you seen a jackalope? No. But Those we saw, are weird, right? Yeah, we saw we saw a uh, uh, we were in Big Bend National Park and saw a giant tarantula crossing the street. That was pretty cool. Wow! Yeah, your kids were into that. Yeah, yeah, wow. we all got out of the car and went and stared at it. It was really cool. Wow! These are the things you can do in Texas. Wow! I'm moving. Yeah. Number three. So number three is in slightly abstract one, but it's very important to me, which is my son's imaginations. So. Um, 10 and 4 and uh, both of them just have these incredible imaginations they love telling stories they don't actually like reality all that much so they really both of them would rather just tell stories and pretend and anytime I try to have actual conversations about what's going on they will like no 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 let's uh, do a funny voice do a like let tell me a story do something completely different and and I love the fact especially that the 10 year old still, still has that yes um, I hope that's he keeps fantastic it for a long time. yeah it's really nice Wow. So he tells you bedtime stories. He does. He does. <laughs> weird, very weird bedtime stories. <laughs> By the way, speaking of bedtime, because probably I was reading your book and because I was thinking about meeting you, I dreamt last night that I was going to University of Michigan <laughs> and that I didn't have... I, I, I bought a copy of the course guide, but I couldn't find it, so I couldn't sign up for any courses. Wow. Yeah. Do you have a connection to the University of Michigan in your life? N-O. Wow. Yeah. This is a deep one. Deep. 
deep. All right, you'll figure that out at okay. some point. Okay, and um, the next? The next one is another book. Uh, it is a memoir called Heavy by an author named Kiesi Lehman that came out last year, and it was the uh, best book that I read last year. Um, it was really meaningful to me. It meant a lot to me that he actually blurbed my book. I asked him and was amazed that he said yes. But this memoir, uh, so he's African-American writer from Mississippi, um, and this book is about growing up uh, as a black person in Mississippi, but it's also about weight and about bodies. Um, and I think this is something that that uh, I've read other black writers wrestling with right now. Like Tana Hase Coates writes about the, the the sort of fact of the black body, and I think it's you know would very complicated question, certainly complicated for a white person like me to understand. But Kiesi talks about the way that. Um, that food and weight was was such an important way of him dealing with the stress and the trauma of growing up the way that he did. And um, what I love about it is just that it's an amazingly honest memoir. Um, he writes it as a letter to his mom. Uh, so it's deep and great, and I'd recommend it to anybody. Thank you. How wonderful. And finally? Finally, fizzy water. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I moved two years ago to uh, Austin, Texas with my family. And Austin, Texas is really good. It's good at a lot of things, but it's especially good at beverages, which makes sense because it's unbelievably hot there. It's like really good uh, uh, beers, craft beers, really good um, iced coffees and iced teas. But they also have this amazing competition going on right now between different fizzy water companies. And it's cheap and it's good. This is one called Topo Chico that started in Mexico. That's fantastic. And there's a local one called Big Swig, which is my favorite. It comes in grapefruit and plain and uh, lime. Um, and they're just so much better than anything that you can get up here in the Northeast. So wow. go down, load up, uh, and, and bring them back. Wow. Paul Tuff. A huge argument for Austin, which I think also the music. Yeah. I mean, it does The barbecue. Have those things. Yeah. And there's a lot going the on. The music. The university. The university. Yeah. The then, Johnson Center. Yes. And then the fizzy The Capitol water. and the fizzy water. A, a real treat talking to you today. For Thank me too. you so much. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been Paul Tuff, author of The Years That Matter Most How College Makes or Breaks Us, which will be published next week by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. You can follow Paul on Twitter at Paul Tough, T O U G H, or on his website at Paul Tough, T O U G H dot com. Also, if you're in the New York area, he has two appearances next week. On Monday the 9th, he'll be at the Barnes & Noble at 86th Street in Manhattan. And on Tuesday, he'll be at the Greenlight Bookstore at 730. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, YouTube, and iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. My blog is at lisabernbach.com, where you'll find links and photos that relate to everything we spoke about today. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Jimmy Regan. My team is Espresso Rucci, Michael Port, and Sam Haft. Until next week, stay cool and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.